Hello everyone. We're just going to wait about five minutes until everybody who is joining this webinar logs on. So we're just going to wait patiently for a few more minutes. If you have not done so already, if you look in the chat box, we have a few links. We have a link to a pre-webinar survey for you to fill out if you have not done so already. Um, this link was sent out in a, an email that was sent today. And we also have a PDF guide to this webinar series with a lot of amazing resources. If you would like to click that link as well, it was also sent in that email. Hi everyone, for all of you who just joined, we are going to wait a few more minutes since we keep getting new attendees logging on. Um, so before we begin in the chat box, there are a few links. There is a link to a pre-webinar survey through a Google form. This Google form was sent out to you all in a recent email from this afternoon. If you have not done so already, please fill it out. It's going to help us improve our future webinars and it is completely anonymous. We also have a PDF guide to this webinar series that includes really incredible resources and information. If you have not looked at the email already, please feel free to click on the link and it will take you straight to that guide. Hi everyone, welcome to JOMA's Women's Health Initiative webinar series. My name is student Dr. Miriam Andrusier. I'm currently in my final year of medical school at SUNY Downstate, and I'm also the vice chair of JOMA's Women's Health Initiative Committee. I'd like to introduce the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association and the Women's Health Initiative series. The Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, also known as JOMA, is a nonprofit organization whose membership includes Jewish Orthodox female physicians and trainees. 
Our goal is to provide evidence-based preventative health and women's health education to the Orthodox community. Tonight, we will cover an overview of topics relating to general women's health. Before that, we'd like to thank our generous sponsors, without which this event would not be possible. JScreen, Sherman Abrams Labs, J the Jewish Fertility Foundation, Extend Fertility, and Turo College. Thank you for being partners with us in promoting women's health education. Also, if you haven't done so already, please take a minute or two to fill out the pre-webinar survey. You could find the link to the survey in the chat. There will also be a post-webinar survey, which you'll receive after Tuesday night's webinar. Please try to fill out both surveys as it will really help us improve future webinars. Now, I'd like to hand the floor over to our moderator, student Dr. Javi Walton. Thank you and enjoy tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Javi Walton. I'm a fourth year medical student at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Before we begin, I would just like to inform you that we will have a question and answer session after all of the speakers finish speaking. And all questions should be posted in the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, it should be there in the middle. It says Q&A with little speech bubbles. If you would like your questions to remain anonymous, please hit the remain anonymous button. There won't be any option to post in the chat box. Also, you will notice that every person viewing this webinar is anonymous, so you cannot see that other attendees are in this webinar. So your presence here is completely anonymous and your voice um, and your video and your voice cannot be enabled. Again, when asking a question, if you'd like to remain anonymous to the panelists, please click the remain anonymous button. I would now like to introduce you to our first speaker, student Dr. Eliana Fine. She's in her last year of medical school in the three year MD program at Stony Brook School of Medicine on the OBGYN residency track. She is also the founder and CEO of Jewish Orthodox Women Medical Association. Hello everyone. So I am Eliana and I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you can all see it and I'm going to start my slideshow in one moment. Okay, so to start with, this webinar today is all going to be about women's health, a general overview, including anatomy, routine health screening, contraception pearls, and sexual health. To begin, um, I'm going to be talking about the female anatomy, sexually transmitted infections, and I'm going to touch briefly upon screening recommendations. In terms of disclosures, I have no disclosures, except please note that none of this information provided in this Webinar is to be considered medical advice, rather medical education, and it should not supplement a consultation with your OBGYN physician. So the learning objectives for um, this, for this slideshow is the following. So we want to understand the normal female anatomy. We want to understand what sexually transmitted infections are, their complications, and ways to minimize your risk. We want to understand what sexually transmitted infection screening methods are available and the recommendations for screening. And we want to understand general women's routine screening. So to begin, we are going to be talking about the reproductive system as a whole. So to start off with, we have here the uterus and the uterus is a main as many as you know, is where a baby develops. And we have the ovaries. Um, if you can see my mouth, I'll scroll over them as well. And so for the ovaries, the ovaries produce eggs that get released during ovulation. And we have the fallopian tubes, which connect the ovaries to the uterus. And then we have the cervix at the bottom of the uterus, which connects the vaginal canal to the uterus. So during ovulation, the ovary produces eggs that get released from the ovary and they travel through the fallopian tube, which is where fertilization typically occurs. 
And that happens when a sperm meets an egg and it develops into an embryo. The embryo then travels through the fallopian tube down into the uterus and it implants in the innermost layer of the uterus wall, which is called the endometrium, which is labeled. And the, the layer of the uterus that is not the innermost layer of the uterus is called the myometrium, and that is composed of muscle. And so what happens if the embryo does not travel from the fallopian tube into the uterus like it's supposed to. So that is called an ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is essentially when an embryo is created, but it does not implant in the uterus, and instead it implants somewhere else. Most commonly it implants in the, or it stays in the fallopian tube, and if you can see it, the fallopian tube is very small and narrow in comparison to the uterus and it does not have the ability, the ability to expand. And therefore it can cause the, um, the woman who has this ectopic pregnancy a lot of pain and it can grow a little bit and it can end up rupturing a fallopian tube which can, which can cause even more pain so that's just to show you what happens when something abnormal occurs. And so next we're going to be talking about the vagina. And in this picture, just to orient yourself, this is the view as if a woman was spreading open her legs. We have at the top, that would be kind of where the belly is and towards the bottom is where the anus is. So, First, I'm going to point out three openings in this area. So we have the urethral opening, which is where um, a person urinates from. And then we have the vaginal opening, which is where intercourse, intercourse occurs and is also where a baby is born from and where uh, menses occurs as well. And then we have a third opening, the anus, which is where stool comes out of. So as you can see from this view, all three openings are very close to one another. We have the labia majora, which is the outermost layer of the vagina, and it essentially covers and protects the vagina. Right underneath it, we have the labia minora. And if you can see, there are two sides to the labia minora, the right and the left, and they both um, come up and they form what is called the clitoral hood, which right underneath is where the clitoris is located. And the clitoris has a high number of nerve endings located within, um, within it. And it's the most sensitive area of the vagina that elicits a sexual feeling and can become erect when it is touched or stimulated. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the Bartholin glands, which are two glands on, in the, on the right and on the left of the opening of the vagina. You can't really see them or feel them unless they become infected and enlarged, but they essentially produce a lubrication to lubricate the vagina to prevent any dryness and also during sexual stimulation. And then we're gonna move on to the next slide where we're going to be talking about the pelvis. And from this point of view, so all the way to the left is the stomach area and then, or like your belly, and then towards the right where my mouse is, is the back. And you're kind of looking at a side view from that angle. So from here you can see that, let's start off with the uterus, which is where a baby develops and grows. And right in front of the uterus, we have the urinary bladder, which stores urine. And then you see that the, the bladder exits the body through the urethra. And then right behind the uterus, we have the rectum and stool leaves the rectum, the rectum through the anus. So here you can also see that the, the anus, the vagina and the urethra are located in very close proximity to one another. 
So during pregnancy, the baby will grow and develop and the uterus will enlarge to accommodate the baby. And um, due to this anatomy of where the uterus is located, it can enlarge and compress on top of the bladder, which can cause feelings of um, needing to urinate more often during pregnancy. And then the uterus can also enlarge in the opposite direction and compress part of the rectum, which can cause symptoms of constipation. Um, there's a condition called endometriosis, which is essentially when cells from the uterus grow outside of the uterus. So typically, uterus cells should only grow in the uterus, but if they grow somewhere else, they can cause pain. Most commonly, those abnormal uterus cells that do not grow where they're supposed to grow, they can grow and implant between the rectum and the vagina. And that is why during sexual intercourse, women who have endometriosis can feel pain during penetration because as you can see, um, the rectum, the vagina, um, they're located very close to one another. Um, in addition, during sexual intercourse, a lot of women might feel the need to urinate during or after, and that can occur because the vaginal opening um, is located right near the urethra, and um, during penetration, the penis can also stimulate the urethra and um, cause those symptoms. And here we're going to be talking about the female anatomy from the view of a pelvic exam. So all the way to the left is when is the viewpoint from when a physician does what is known as um, a speculum exam. So essentially the physician is going to place a speculum, which is the device to open up the vagina so that the physician can look inside. And if you look all the way to the right, we see a picture of an actual cervix, and that is what the physician sees. So that's a picture taken from the viewpoint of uh, looking through a speculum exam into the vagina. So we see that the cervix has a little bit of an opening, and typically it is closed. During different points of the menstrual cycle, like during ovulation, it can open a little bit to allow um, sperm to enter the uterus. Um, during labor, I'm sure many of you have heard of um, a woman being one centimeter, two centimeters, 10 centimeters dilated. Dilated means opened. So that's telling you how opened a woman's cervix is. So typically, the woman's cervix is closed but during labor and delivery, it will open to accommodate a baby to leave from the uterus into the vaginal canal to the outside world. And so we see during going back to the picture all the way to the left, that during a pap smear, the physician will insert a, a brush and collect some of the, the cells from the surface of the cervix. And we see from this point of view as well that so we have the uterus right, on, right in front of the uterus. We have the bladder right behind the uterus. We have the rectum, and that is the viewpoint. We're going to talk a little bit more about pap smears later on. Um, and then in the middle of the screen, we have another picture of what the anatomy looks like during a classic pelvic exam, which is when a physician inserts two fingers through the vagina and touches um, the, the patient's um, top of their pelvis to try to feel the organs that are inside. And so as you can see that right underneath this physician's hand is the, uh, the uterus. And typically a woman's uterus is very small. If a woman is pregnant, the uterus is enlarged and will feel bigger than normal. Um, if a, a patient has something called a fibroid, a fibroid is an abnormal um, benign growth in the uterus. It can cause the uterus to feel larger than it should normally feel. And then we have um, the ovary 
and typically ovaries are very small and uh, it should not be felt or if it could be felt it would be felt as a, a very like small structure but if a patient has like a tumor growing on their ovary or something abnormal in their anatomy in that area the physician will be able to feel that and be able to help the patient accordingly and then we are going to talk about sexually transmitted infections. And first, I would like to preface why it's important to educate yourself on this topic and be aware of sexually transmitted infections, which are also known as STIs. So I understand that as Orthodox Jewish women, we hold monogamy in a very high regard and we highly discourage premarital intercourse, which are both protective factors against the transmission of sexually transmitted infections. However, it's still important to educate yourself because things happen in life um, that are beyond our control and things don't always go as planned. For example, women may get divorced and remarry, spouses may unfortunately have affairs, spouses may pass away and then the widow may remarry, um, women may marry a Baal Teshuva who um, became a Baal Teshuva after he um, may have had um, sexual intercourse with other women and some women and girls don't necessarily follow halakha and so it's just important to be aware of sexually transmitted infections and what you can do to minimize your risk. So what are sexually transmitted infections? So they are bacterial or viral infections that are caused by spread through sexual contact. So they can occur anywhere where sexual contact occurs, which can be the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, the urethra. Remember, the urethra is in close proximity to the vagina, the rectum, um, for the same reason with the, the urethra and the mouth. Um, so what are risk factors? So risk factors for STIs are having a new partner, having multiple partners, having a partner who is not monogamous. And so essentially, the more um, sexual intercourse a woman has, or the more partners a woman has, or the more partners a woman's partner may have, whether or not she is aware of those partners or not, those are all risk factors for sexually transmitted infections. And anyone who is sexually active is essentially at risk. Um, so that's why it's extremely important to be aware of sexually transmitted infections. And in terms of what you can do to minimize your risk. So generally speaking, for people with multiple partners or in non-monogamous relationships, the best way is to use condoms. Uh, but for women who are in monogamous relationships, it's still important to be aware of sexually transmitted infections because for many of these infections, um, they can present asymptomatically, meaning the woman won't feel any symptoms or any pain um, and they can still have a sexually transmitted infection and just not necessarily know it. And many of these sexually transmitted infections can have devastating effects on the woman, um, on her body, on her, on her infertility. And if she's pregnant and has a sexually transmitted infection, it can be passed on to the baby and cause serious um, devastating effects. So these are reasons why it's important to be aware. Um, and we're going to go through four um, commonly sexually transmitted infections. Note there are more, but these are the four very common ones that many might hear about. So the two I'm going to pair together are chlamydia and gonorrhea, since they present very similarly together, since they present very similarly and have similar effects on a woman. So how are they transmitted through sexual contact? What are some of the symptoms that chlamydia and gonorrhea can present with? So for many women, they are asymptomatic, meaning the woman does not feel any symptoms at all and she may not even know she has chlamydia or gonorrhea. It can cause painful or frequent urination. It can cause yellow discharge from the vagina or the urethra. Typically, it'll be a lot of discharge and not um, just a normal amount. It's normal for women to have some discharge, but it's not normal to have an extreme amount. 
Um, you can have vaginal bleeding in between the periods. You can have rectal bleeding and or pain. Um, so these are just some symptoms that both chlamydia and gonorrhea typically present with. So the reason why it's important to be aware is because of the complications. So we have something known as pelvic inflammatory disease, which can essentially cause a lot of pelvic pain. And so um, that's one of the complications. Another devastating complication is, is infertility. Um, a third is that it can infect the baby if a mom is pregnant and has a sexual and has chlamydia or gonorrhea. Um, if Many of you know when you have a baby, they will always ask if they can put an antibiotic ointment on the baby's eyes when the baby is born, and that's to prevent blindness because chlamydia and gonorrhea um, typically can cause blindness um, in a baby if um, its mom had um, gonorrhea or chlamydia during pregnancy. And so we want to just prevent that. So that's why they put the, that eye cream on the baby. And then we have HPV. So the transmission for HPV is skin-to-skin -skin contact with the genital warts during sexual contact and sexual intercourse. So for many women, this presents asymptomatic. Many women don't know they have HPV. For some women, they can have genital warts. And a major complication of HPV is that it can cause changes to cells and it can lead to cancer. So anywhere where HPV is located, that's where um, it can cause cells to become abnormal and cancer to develop. So that could be the cervix, that could be the vagina, that could be the anus, that could be the mouth. And so HPV is the only sexually transmitted infection that you can prevent up to 99%. So we have what is called the HPV vaccine, and uh, it is also known as the Gardasil vaccine. And it is safe, it is effective. You can uh, give it um, to your children, and you can also take it as an adult, and it protects against the most common types of HPV that cause genital warts and that cause um, cancer. And so if a, if a boy or girl gets the HPV vaccine prior to being sexually active, then it can essentially protect them against all forms of HPV versus if someone gets the vaccine once they are already sexually active, they may have been exposed to different types of HPV, but for the types that they, they were not exposed to that the vaccine covers, they will be protected against those. And then um, in terms of prevention for HPV, we also have what is called the path mirror, which I um, explained a little bit in a prior slide, but a pap smear essentially screens for HPV. So if you know a person has HPV and they're not symptomatic, you can do something and help them to prevent um, it ever leading to cancer. And then we have herpes. So herpes, the transmission is also skin-to-skin -skin contact with the genital sores during sexual contact. And symptoms for herpes. So it is important to note that herpes um, can cause recurrent outbreaks, but typically for the first outbreak, initially a patient can have flu-like symptoms like fever, chills, muscle aches, and then uh, later on, genital sores can develop, which are typically flu um, fluid-filled, and they can cause stinking or burning upon urination, and they typically last two to four weeks. And in terms of complications, so herpes can infect a baby if a woman is pregnant and um, has herpes and has um, genital lesions from herpes. And then if they have, if they give birth nat like naturally and they have those lesions in the vaginal area, the baby can become exposed to the herpes and they can develop um, an infection. And this type of infection is very devastating in a baby and has a, a very poor um, mor morbidity and mortality. And it's important to note that the viruses of like sexually transmitted infections 
viruses don't really have a cure. So HPV has no cure, herpes has no cure. Um, you can do things to mitigate your risk of it developing into um, various complications, but there's no cure. As opposed to chlamydia and gonorrhea, since they are bacterial infections, you can take antibiotics and you can essentially cure yourself of chlamydia and gonorrhea, and then hopefully you don't get infected again and don't have to take more antibiotics. So this is why it's very important to be aware of these sexually transmitted infections. And then we're going to go on to the next slide where we're going to talk about routine health screening recommendations. So we have the HPV vaccine, also known as the Gardasil 9, which I explained a little about previously. So this is a vaccine for girls and boys ages nine up until 45. And uh, remember it is safe and effective. And then we have pap smears. So, uh, Pap smears, every woman should get every three to five years. I'm ages 21 to 65 to screen for HPV and cervical cancer. And then we have sexually transmitted infection screening and testing. So uh, it is recommended that women under the age of 25 who are sexually active have yearly screening. And for women above the age of 25 who have risk factors should also be screened. Um, when a woman is pregnant, um, your OBGYN will typically screen you at the beginning of pregnancy and at the end of pregnancy, just because there are a lot of devastating effects on a baby if a woman is pregnant with um, a sexually transmitted infection. So they typically screen for that during pregnancy as well. And then there are mammograms which um, it is recommended that every woman at the age of 40 and onwards have a mammogram, mammogram to screen for breast cancer every one to two years. And uh, then we have the colonoscopy, which screens for colon cancer that women should get starting at 45 years, about every 10 years. And then we have- so Sorry to interrupt. We are going to just do a one minute um, warning wrap up. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And then we have the DEXA bone scan, which essentially screens for osteoporosis, and that begins at age 65. Um, Dr. Denise Moses is an OBGYN physician, and she is going to talk a little bit more about the routine health screening recommendations and go in, into more depth about them, but this is just the basics. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand the talk back over to Javi, who is the moderator. Thank you so much, Eliana. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Denise Moses. Dr. Moses trained in obstetrics and gynecology at North, Thor North Shore Long Island Jewish Hospital and is now in private practice here in New York. She's a board certified OBGYN. Dr. Moses, you can share your slide. Hi, everyone. I'm going to speak about uh, screening and sexual health. So, um, hold on. Um, I don't have any disclosures. And um, this lecture, of course, does not constitute medical advice and should not replace being a doctor. Um, so we want to understand um, an overview of women's health screening, uh, understand sexual health, female sexual dysfunction, um, LGBTQ issues and women's health and some myths. So what do women need to be screened? Um, breast, cervix, bones, colon, heart, lungs, STIs, uh, cholesterol, diabetes, and their skin. And um, it's very important to get screened so that this way we can um, prevent diseases from occurring. So it's important to see your primary care physician and OBGYN at least once a year. Um, I'm gonna talk about some risk factors for breast cancer. So family history is extremely important. Um, and we look at the family history of, of breast cancer and ovarian cancer and other uh, cancers that are associated with them, like pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, things like that. 
Um, we also uh, look at if you know uh, the person has a harmful gene mutation that is associated with causing cancer, a prior breast biopsy with certain um, different types of cells that could cause um, cancer to be forming later, um, early age at first period, and late age at menopause. Um, more risk factors include um, a long time between their first period and first pregnancy, older age, certain ethnicities, um, and Ashkenazi Jewish women are known to have an increased risk of the BRCA mutation, um, higher BMI, drinking alcohol, smoking, um, having dense breasts on mammogram, and prior exposure to a high dose um, chest irradiation in young women. So for example, like women who have had um, lymphoma in the past are um, at increased risk for breast cancer. So um, we start doing breast exams in the office at age 25. Um, the recommendation is for mammography to start yearly after age 40. And um, we don't uh, recommend self-breast exam um, in average risk women. This is what a mammogram looks like. Um, essentially, the breast goes between these two plates, and um, there's an image taken of the breast. A radiologist will look at it and determine if there's any pathology. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Um, so those include the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, those increase the risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. The breast cancer risk is over 45%. The ovarian cancer risk is higher in people with the BRCA1 mutation. Um, and these genes are found in high-risk groups such as Ashkenazi Jews, um, and they have different screening guidelines, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Um, but if you have a family history, you may want to talk to your doctor about getting tested for these genes. Um, in terms of ovarian cancer, there is no screening test for ovarian cancer, um, but there are some risk-reducing strategies, such as removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes around age 40, um, for example, when most women are done with having children. Um, some women would benefit from talking to their OBGYNs or infertility specialists about freezing their eggs. Um, for breast cancer screening, if we have a woman who has a known BRAC mutation, um, she'll start yearly imaging at age 25, and then after age 30, she'll alternate her mammogram and MRI every six months. Um, she also is a candidate for risk-reducing surgery. So um, a mastectomy, which is removal of the breast tissue, can decrease the risk of breast cancer by 85 to 100%. And we know that removal of the tubes and ovaries may also reduce the risk of breast cancer. Um, Essie from JScreen will uh, discuss more um, in terms of the genetic testing. And if more details are desired by you guys, then we'll give a follow-up lecture. Colon cancer screening uh, starts at age 45 for people at average risk. Um, and there's different options. Uh, some are stool-based tests, some are colonoscopy, um, which is an image-based test. Um, these are some of the things that you can see on colonoscopy, um, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, polyps, cancer. Osteoporosis screening, it starts at age 65 for women or before age 65, if they have a history of a fragility fracture, they are um, less than 127 pounds. They have different medical causes of bone loss if they're taking certain medications or if they have other diseases. Um, if they have a parental medical history of a hip fracture, if they smoke um, or if they uh, consume alcohol and um, if they have a history of rheumatoid arthritis. This is a bone density scan, also known as a DEXA scan. Um, and it's a low-dose x-ray, and this is um, a picture showing how it's taken. In order for us as women to reduce the risk of bone loss and fracture, we have to uh, do some weight-bearing exercises, 
um, muscle strengthening exercises, and take calcium and vitamin D. So um, these are the recommended dietary allowances for calcium and vitamin D um, per age group. So, um, you know, take note uh, so you know how much you need to take. Now I'll move on to sexual health. Okay, it's very important and it's also normal, um, part of every woman's life. Um, many women feel uncomfortable talking about it, but if you can't talk to us, then who can you talk to? Um, and a great resource is um, this link, ACOG.org. Okay, um, so I'll go right in to sexual dysfunction disorders, and about 43% of women report um, having a sexual problem with um, some people saying that it's so bothersome that it leads to distress. So these are a couple of the um, disorders um, where there's um, interest in arousal disorder, orgasmic disorder, um, pain, and um, substance of medication-induced dysfunction. And these symptoms are usually present for five months and cause personal distress. Pain with sex can be due to medications, breastfeeding, and lack of lubrication. Um, breastfeeding lowers the estrogen level and causes um, some lack of lubrication there as well. So definitely speak to your OBGYN if you're having pain, decreased libido, or discomfort. It's really not supposed to hurt. Um, and we um, work in partnership with pelvic floor physical therapists who help to manage pain during intercourse. Um, these are some myths that um, women have discussed with me about orgasm. And, um, you know, these are mostly just not true. Um, so women can have an orgasm from just uh, penetration. Women can have multiple orgasms. If a woman doesn't have an orgasm, something is wrong with her. Um, women are always well lubricated during intercourse. Um, women can have an orgasm at the same um, time as their male partner. And orgasms are like explosions for everyone. Um, everyone kind of feels differently. Women are not always well lubricated, and there are different kinds of um, lubrications that we discuss in the office. Um, you know, some women can have multiple orgasms. That's not always the case, and it's very rare that a woman can ha actually have an orgasm just from penetration. And this ties into the female sexual response, and you can see it's kind of a circular model, and it kind of goes back and forth. It's not linear. Um, so they have to have motivation, they have to be willing to, to do it, they have to be um, aroused, not just in the uh, physical sense, but also um, in the emotional and mental sense. It starts in the brain. Um, just some tips on reducing irritation um, in the vulva, um, using mild soaps and detergents, never douche. Don't wear underwear to sleep. Try and wipe front to back. Um, urinate after intercourse. Drink lots of water. And um, it's been shown that some spermicides can be associated with UTIs. I'll go on to talk about the LGBTQ. So sexual orientation is an emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction. It's a spectrum. Um, but these Women can be at risk um, for depression, eating disorders, and substance abuse, and there are resources to help, which I'll post after. Um, safe sex practices are important as well. Um, and intimate partner violence is another very important concept. Um, it doesn't just include physical abuse. It includes psychological stalking, deprivation, intimidation, and reproductive coercion. And it occurs without consent. Um, and it can happen in heterosexual or same-sex couples. And it's um, experienced by both men and women in every community, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, and educational background. 
So you can talk to your doctor about it. They keep uh, most details very confidential and some states have different laws. Um, this is the uh, cycle of abuse and the different types of abuse that can occur. These are some resources um, for domestic violence. Um, Shalom Task Force is a known Jewish organization. And that's it. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendez. Our next speaker will be um, Esty Rose. She is Dr. Esty Rose. She's a genetic counselor at JScreen. She's one of our sponsor, which is one of our sponsors, and she will be speaking about the importance of genetic screening. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see your screen. My lighting is a little bit funny and it looks like I'm in a tanning salon, um, but I'm not. I'm in my basement. Um, okay. Okay, so my name is Esty and I'm a genetic counselor for JScreen. Um, if you haven't heard of what a genetic counselor is before, or maybe you've heard of it but didn't really know what it was, um, I'll just take a minute to explain. Um, basically, genetic counselors are people who have master's degrees in genetic counseling. So we are trained in genetics and we're also trained in education and counseling. So a lot of times we're dealing with people who are undergoing a lot of stress because they just got news that is or could be very stressful to them. So in addition to understanding the genetics and learning how to explain it to people, we're also there for them emotionally and we help people um, walk or kind of walk them through pretty serious decisions. Um, you might see genetic counselors in many different areas of medicine. Um, probably the most common ones you've seen is in the prenatal setting. So when people are pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, um, you might also see a genetic counselor in a pediatric setting. So let's say there's a child who's having um, issues with development or if their pediatrician thinks that there is uh, some kind of a genetic syndrome going on. Um, and probably the third most common place you might see a genetic counselor is in the cancer setting. Um, if somebody has a personal or or pretty strong family history of cancer, they might see a genetic counselor. Um, we're also in other areas of medicine, but those are probably the three most common places you might see us. Um, if anybody has any questions about genetic counseling or if you're interested in maybe becoming a genetic counselor, I'm always happy to mentor people and help them through the process. Um, not many people know much about it, so um, I'm happy for you to reach out to me if you have any questions. So today I'm going to talk to you um, specifically about reproductive carrier screening, which is carrier screening that we do before people have their babies. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, what to test for, who to test, when to test, where to test, and what happens when we have a carrier couple. So what I'm not going to talk about today um, is those other areas of genetic counseling that I mentioned before. So if somebody has a family history of a genetic disease and or cancer, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm not going to talk about genetic conditions that are not hereditary, meaning that do not run in families like Down syndrome. And I'm also not going to talk about um, pediatric issues. But if you have any questions about any of those things, um, I wrote some resources down here. Um, J screen where I work and I'll explain um, in a couple minutes what we do um, is launching a cancer genetic testing panel in a couple of weeks. So if you might be interested in doing any kind of cancer genetic testing right down this website over here. Um, we'll be launching a 63 cancer gene panel so you can register your email address and we will let you know when we launch. And if you need a genetic counselor in your area, please visit this website find a genetic counselor.com and by searching through your zip code, um, we can find a genetic counselor near you. So now let's talk about what we actually are going to talk about tonight. Why should we get tested for reproductive carrier screening? So Jewish genetic diseases is a group of diseases that happen specifically in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Probably the most common one that you've heard of and also probably one of the more serious ones is called Tay-Sachs disease. Um, about one in 30 people who are Ashkenazi or Eastern European Jewish is a carrier for Tay-Sachs. Um, if you compare that to the general population, people who are not Ashkenazi, um, their carrier frequency is about 1 in 300. So Tay-Sachs is something that happens more commonly in people who are Ashkenazi Jewish, but it's not exclusive to people who are Ashkenazi. So anybody could be a carrier for any Jewish genetic, any genetic disease or even the Jewish genetic diseases. It's just more common in people who are Ashkenazi. 
Um, you might remember the Punnett squares from high school bio, but I'll quickly review them. Um, most of the Jewish genetic diseases are what we call autosomal recessive. Um, an autosomal recessive condition happens when both the mother and the father are both carriers of that condition, and they both pass it along to their baby. In general, carriers of these conditions don't have any symptoms of the conditions they carry, so they're walking around totally healthy and they have no idea that they're carriers, but when both the husband and wife carry that same condition, every time there's a pregnancy, there's a one in four chance over here that the baby will be affected. So there's a 75% chance that the baby will be okay, but there's a 25% chance or one in four chance that the baby will be affected. And each pregnancy that a carrier couple has together has that one in four chance, and they're totally independent of each other. So you can have a carrier couple who's very lucky, who has all of their children totally healthy. You can have an unlucky couple where all of them have the condition, and then there's everything in between. So for these recessive conditions, there's a 25% chance with each pregnancy for their baby to be affected. Um, does carrier screening work? Uh, yes, it definitely does. Um, here you can see that in 1970, there were about 45 cases of Tay-Sachs disease in the US. By 1980, 10 years later, when we started doing carrier screening for Tay-Sachs, that number greatly got reduced. And over the course of years, that number got a lot lower. Um, nowadays, if a baby's going to be born with Tay-Sachs, it's usually not a Jewish baby. Um, it's usually a baby who has another ethnic background where the parents had no idea that carrier screening was important and they didn't get screened before their pregnancies. So definitely carrier screening does work. What should we test for? Um, here's a list of some of the more common diseases that we're testing for. Um, JScreen right now actually has a panel of over 200 conditions. These are the most common ones seen in people who are Ashkenazi. Um, here's a little timeline of how um, carrier screening um, has uh, kind of evolved through the ages. We started in the 70s with just Tay-Sachs testing, like I showed you before. But over the course of years, we've added more and more diseases. And like I said, uh, now JScreen is testing for over 200 conditions. And these conditions include those that are common in people who are Sephardi and, Ash and um, Mizrahi as well. So it's not just an Ashkenazi testing thing anymore. It's also for people who are Sephardi and Mizrahi. Um, the reason that we think it's important to test people for many more conditions and not just the basic, very common Ashkenazi conditions is because ethnicity lines have blurred. Um, a lot of people now have mixed ancestry or they don't necessarily know their ancestry where they thought they've known them. Um, a lot of people are learning through ancestry testing like 23andMe um, that they are not as Ashkenazi as they initially thought they were. So over the course of years, um, the genetics experts have changed their recommendations and now the recommendation is that everybody should get tested for everything that's available. We call it expanded carrier screening. Um, it's kind of like a one size fits all testing. Anybody, regardless of their ethnicity, gets tested for many, many conditions, and it's not just an Ashkenazi test anymore. Um, also, people who already have been tested should consider getting updated testing if they're still having children, because as you saw with that timeline, a lot of things have changed and we've upgraded our testing panel over the years. Um, at JScreen, now that we're testing for so many conditions, we see that most of our patients actually are positive. Um, about 75% of our patients is going to test positive for at least one condition. So it's totally normal to be a carrier. Most people we test are carriers. Um, it shouldn't be a stigma to be a carrier. Um, it's just something that we all have and we just need to take care of it and just be careful to make sure that we're not um, you know, reproducing with somebody who's also a carrier. And if we do get to that point, there is something to do about it. And I'll get to that in a moment. So who should test? Like I said, really anybody planning to have a family, um, whether it's their first child or if they're expanding their family, anybody planning to have a child um, should um, have reproductive carrier screening. Um, even mixed Jewish couples, meaning Ashkenazi, Sephardi, slash um, Ashkenazi, Sephardi couples, people who are interfaith, single sex couples, um, single parents to be, everybody having a baby needs to get tested when to test. Um, our recommendation is that people should test before they get pregnant. Um, the timing of that could be very different from one couple to the next. So some people might decide to share the results before first date. Some decide to share the results or to get tested while they're dating or maybe after they're engaged or even after they're married. But whenever it is, it's best to do it before pregnancy. And the reason that it's better to do it before pregnancy is because there will be more options available to carrier couples who are not already pregnant. There are fewer options when there's already a pregnancy underway where to get tested. So um, I put JScreen at the top because um, I think 
we're awesome. Um, Jace Green is an online um, testing program where people um, order their test online. We send them a saliva kit, they spit into the tube, and then the results come back um, a couple weeks later. And then those results are reviewed by a genetic counselor, either by phone or by Zoom. Um, it's a very easy and affordable way to get tested. And I'll get into the details a little bit later. Um, if somebody has something a little bit more um, um, serious or if they have a little bit more of a detailed family history, I would recommend that they not go through JScreen, but that they go through a local genetic counselor um, because they can address those specific needs for that family. Sorry. Um, another option is to go to your doctor. A lot of OBGYNs do the testing. Um, some pediatricians or internists can do the testing. But I do recommend that if somebody's doing it not through a genetic specialist, that they make sure that the doctor who's doing the test is very up to date and is not ordering testing that's a little bit out of date. Um, many of doctors' offices actually go through us and they use JScreen for their testing. Um, so um, just be careful if you're going to go through your doctor just to make sure that they're um, up to date. Uh, you might have also heard of Dory Sharim. Um, Dory Sharm is a fantastic program that serves the Orthodox community. Um, my only issue is that they underscreen, uh, meaning that they're not testing for many conditions and they're pretty limited in their testing. So um, as a clinician, I do not recommend that people use them um, just because of the fact that they're not testing for enough conditions and they're missing carriers because of that. Um, options for carrier couples. So when we have a carrier couple, we do not tell them that they have to break up. Um, there are a couple of options that we discuss as genetic counselors. Some of them are to break up. Some of them are to not have children or to not have children naturally um, of their own, like for example, to adopt. Um, some people will decide to use a donor sperm or egg from somebody who's not a carrier of that condition. Um, others might decide to take a chance with each pregnancy and they might choose during the pregnancy to test the fetus to see whether or not it's affected with the condition. Um, you can do that test. Um, that test is called a CVS or an amniocentesis, and you're going to learn more about this tomorrow. Um, and then another option that we tell people who are carrier couples is that they could do um, a procedure called in vitro fertilization, IVF, where the woman gives an egg sample and the man gives a sperm sample. They put it together in the lab. And then the last step before they make that embryo, sorry, um, then they make an embryo. And the last step before they implant the embryo into the woman's body is to do um, genetic testing on that embryo. It's it's called pre-implantation genetic testing, where they test the embryo to see whether or not it's affected with the condition. If it is affected, they discard it in the lab and it never becomes a baby. But if they see that the embryo is not affected with the condition, they implant it into the woman and hopefully it leads to a successful pregnancy. So we no longer tell people that when they're carrier couples that they have to break up. We counsel them about their options. Each couple will make their own decisions based on so many different factors. Um, everybody's different and there is so many reasons to do each one and um, our job is to kind of talk you through it and help you figure out which one makes the most sense for you. Um, JScreen, like I said before, is a national nonprofit um, organization where we provide carrier screening for over 200 conditions. Um, I did mention the process before. Everything is done online. Um, we are based out of Emory University in Atlanta, and we have medical oversight from our genetics department over there. So the entire process is done um, very clinically and very responsibly because we are um, we have genetic counselors throughout the process. So if anybody is uncomfortable with the at-home kind of testing, rest assured, everything that we're doing is done um, in a kosher way um, and in a very um, medically responsible way. Um, if anybody wants to get tested um, through JScreen, um, I wrote down a coupon code over here. Um, if you type in JScreen at home um, at the end of your checkout, it will give you $18 off of your kit. Um, the general cost for a kit is $149 if you provide insurance information. So with this code, you'll get $18 off. Sorry to interrupt. We are going to do a one minute warning just to wrap up. I'm done. Um, if you Thank want to you. contact me, I'm happy to, to answer any questions or to help anybody with anything. You can take down my email address right here. Um, and that's it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Sarah Wertheimer. She completed her OBGYN residency at Albert Einstein Montefiore Medical Center, and she's now finishing her subspecialty training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility in Los Angeles, California. She is also the chair of the Women's Health Initiative Committee. She will be joining a private practice in Los Angeles next year. Hi, Esty, I think you need to stop here.
Hi everyone, I'm Sahar Wertheimer and I will be talking about the menstrual cycle and contraception. Um, and the reason I think it's important to talk about the menstrual cycle is because um, um, it is uh, it, it is the way that we understand um, how pregnancy happens, how infertility happens, how bleeding happens. Oops, sorry. Um, one second. Okay, um, how pregnancy happens, how withdrawal bleeding happens, and how contraception works. Um, and for that reason, I am going to go through it a little bit slowly. This is as technical as we're going to get tonight. Um, so basically, the way the menstrual cycle happens is your brain sends a signal to the ovaries um, to um, start producing follicles. And this hormone that does the signal is called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. As the follicles get bigger, they, they secrete estrogen, which is a hormone that causes your lining to thicken amongst other um, roles that it has, your uterine lining. And then the um, estrogen at a certain critical level um, turns on or has the brain signal luteinizing hormone or LH, also known as the LH surge, which your ovulation predictor kits, if you've ever used them, um, detect as ovulation. The LH surge basically causes the follicle that was housing the egg to release the egg um, so that it can be fertilized. And that's what ovulation is. Ovulation is your follicles releasing an egg um, in the middle of your cycle every month. Um, um, as after ovulation happens, the shell or where the egg was housed, the follicle, um, now is called the corpus luteum and the corpus luteum secretes progesterone. Progesterone, whereas estrogen caused your lining to thicken, progesterone causes your lining to be stabilized. And therefore, if no pregnancy happens, then the corpus luteum will begin to die off and progesterone will um, begin to withdraw. When your body sees withdrawal of progesterone, it um, sheds the lining because it is no longer being stabilized. So your period every month is the withdrawal of progesterone. Um, However, uh, for pregnancy to happen, once the egg is ovulated, if it is fertilized by sperm, which requires sperm, then, um, then it'll um, travel to the uterus. So your fallopian tubes need to be open for this. And we'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow night. Um, but as you can see here on the other half of my slide, egg meets the, the egg meets the sperm in the fallopian tube and fertilization should happen here. The, what is then the fertilized egg is called an embryo, and that travels through the fallopian tube to the uterus um, where implantation will happen. So all of these things need to um, line up for pregnancy to happen, and it, um, it actually only happens 25% of the time in fertile couples every month. So um, it can, it can you know, a lot of things need to line up for, for pregnancy to happen. And, um, and if any of these things are affected, there's a lot of places, in other words, where, um, where things can go wrong and infertility can happen. If implantation is achieved, then the implanted embryo begins to secrete a hormone which causes the corpus luteum to be maintained and not to die off, and therefore for progesterone to be maintained and not to withdraw so that you don't bleed when you're pregnant. So what I really wanted everyone to take away from here is that it all comes down to estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen causes your lining to be built up. Progesterone causes it to be stabilized, prevents it from shedding. If implantation, just to recap, does not happen, there will be um, nothing to maintain the corpus luteum to, and nothing to sell the corpus luteum to continue secreting progesterone. Progesterone will withdraw and your lining will shed. So now that we understand how pregnancy happens, we can understand how to prevent pregnancy. So we said before, you need the sperm to meet the egg. If something um, blocks the sperm from entering the female reproductive tract, um, which could include barrier methods of contraception, and I'm gonna show you all these methods in a second, 
or if you thicken the cervical mucus so much that sperm cannot penetrate, then that's one way to prevent pregnancy. Another way is just to shut down the whole hormonal axis to begin with. And we do that by sending the brain signals that we already have estrogen progesterone, you don't need to worry about it, you can just shut down, your job is done. And then ovulation doesn't happen and so there's no egg release to be fertilized. Another way is to thin out the uterine lining so much that a fertilized egg cannot implant because we said implantation is a necessary step for pregnancy. Another way to do this is not necessarily to thin the lining, but to um, prevent implantation by causing inflammation inside the uterus. And that is how the copper IUD, which is a non-hormonal method, and I'm gonna go over that in just a bit, um, how, that, how the copper IUD works. Um, and the copper IUD does not harm the lining. It does not cause any um, permanent damage, but that is how it works temporarily. So breakthrough bleeding, um, you know, as gynecologists, we get this question a lot. We get this question, you know, when women are um, trying to do their seven clean days before the mikvah, we get it before um, women are trying to get married. They don't want to be um, uh, in on their menses during their wedding. Um, we get it in all shapes and sizes. Breakthrough bleeding is annoying. Um, and it happens in uh, for a few different reasons. And I'm really just touching on a few, but it can happen if you're not on birth control. It can happen because you're having so much estrogen exposure, meaning the lining is being built up and not enough progesterone um, to withdraw it and cause a clean cycle. So this can happen in women, and we'll talk about this in some of our other sessions, who have PCOS because PCOS, um, women with PCOS do not ovulate regularly all the time. And so they're never getting that progesterone to be secreted. It can also happen in women who are obese because your fat cells make estrogen. And so in women who have an excess amount of fat cells, there is excess estrogen exposure on the lining and um, not necessarily enough progesterone to combat this. Um, and in those cases, both PCOS, obesity, whenever estrogen is, um, is there and, not, and there is not enough progesterone to kind of stabilize or withdraw that, your lining builds up and it can lead to precancerous or cancerous cells um, causing endometrial cancer. Other ways that you can get breakthrough bleeding are um, pathology inside the uterus like polyps, pregnancies, or infections. These can just cause your cells around the cervix to be a little bit um, more what we call friable or um, like they bleed easier. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just needs to be taken care of or in pregnancy, not taken care of, whichever. Um, and then if you're on birth control, breakthrough bleeding can happen in methods where um, we're not exactly shutting down the axis well enough or strong enough. Um, and um, it also happens very commonly when women forget to take the pill um, and they skip a day or they don't, or they um, skip two days here and there, then your body's kind of getting mixed messages and it's not being, the hormonal axis is not being shut off. Um, so this brings me to contraception. Um, and so contraception is birth control and um, it is necessary because 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unintended. Um, birth control is a preventative measure. So in other words, it's not, um, it's not stopping a pregnancy that has already happened. It's preventing the pregnancy from happening to begin with. And this plays a role in some of the halakhic guidance that we have. Um, birth control is safe for as long as you want to use birth control. Um, there's no impact on future fertility. There is one method called the depo provera. It's an intramuscular injection. And you'll hear about this on Tuesday night more in depth. But the depo provera can cause a little bit of a delayed return to fertility, but it does not decrease increase fertility. Um, and then we use birth control to treat a lot of other things because there's a lot of other things that are impacted by estrogen and progesterone. And when we shut down that access, we can control those. So if somebody has abnormal bleeding, if they have very heavy periods, if they have acne, menstrual migraines, those are all, um, those are all affected by your menstrual hormones. Um, and very importantly, especially during Corona, you do not need a pelvic exam to get a prescription. So, um, you know, uh, access to getting birth control should be very easy. You should be able to call your doctor and get it. So there's two main types of contraception. And again, I think um, we mentioned this, but it's gonna be covered much more in depth on Tuesday night. I'm really giving a very brief overview. Um, there's non-hormonal methods and then there's hormonal methods. 
hormone, of the non-hormonal ethics, as you can see on this chart, efficacy goes up as you go towards the top of the chart. And these percentages here are failure rates. So um, these barrier methods of non-hormonal, like spermicide, the female condom, the male condom, the diaphragm, they all have um, only 70 to 80% efficacy, meaning they, their failure rate is high. Um, however, one non-hormonal method that is very effective is the copper IUD, which prevents implantation, as I said before. And because it's non-hormonal, you're going to get your period every month. We're not taking over your hormones. Of the hormonal methods, um, they can either work by preventing ovulation or by thickening your cervical mucus so that sperm cannot penetrate. And this is very important for people to understand. There is two categories. One is called combined hormonal. This means it has both estrogen and progesterone in it. Then there's also progesterone only methods. Why would you choose one over the other? So estrogen um, helps suppress ovulation, which can decrease your premenstrual symptoms, which happen with uh, ovulation or periovulation. And, they can, um, and therefore you can lighten bleeding. It decreases your risk of ovarian cancer. It also increases a hormone which binds up your male hormone in your body. And therefore you have decreased acne, you have that nice skin, and you have um, decreased coarse hair. Um, however, one of the cons is that if you stop ovulation, you also stop the little spike in libido that happens around there. And some women also complain of migraines with estrogen. Progesterone thins the endometrial lining so it can lighten your bleeding up a lot. Um, however, some women complain of headaches, of breast enlargement, edema, and bloating and mood swings with just progesterone only methods. So which method you want really depends on what are the symptoms that you're trying to combat. Methods that have both estrogen and progesterone, like I said, are called combined hormonal methods. There's no such thing as a method that has estrogen only, and that's because of the risk of endometrial cancer that we spoke about if you use estrogen without progesterone. Methods that have estrogen, the combined hormonal ones, are the patch, the ring, and some combined pills. There's also progesterone-only pills. So the progesterone-only methods include the Depo-Provera shot, which I mentioned, the Nexplanon or the implant in the arm, um, the progestin IUD, the mini pills, um, which women take after they give birth um, because we don't want to expose breastfeeding women or infants to excess progesterone. And also because right after you give birth, there is a risk of blood clots and we don't want to increase that risk by giving you estrogen which leads me to the next slide. Um, the relative contraindications to birth control um, are if you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, if you have a history of blood clots, migraines with aura, which means that you have some sort of visual component to your migraines or some sort of sense that they're coming on. So a regular migraine does not um, preclude you from having uh, combined birth control, but, um, uh, and sorry, this is an important point. This is specifically contraindications to combined methods, methods with estrogen. And if you're a smoker over age 35. Um, alternatives to these methods for women that may um, have some of these conditions are progestin only methods or non-hormonal methods. Um, I should also mention there's a lot of other methods which, contraindi which are contraindications like breast cancer or liver disease. Um, and that's the reason why you would consult with your doctor. Um, to keep it in perspective, the risk of blood clots in these groups is still very rare. And not only that, but uh, you have to always remember that pregnancy or the postpartum period is a much higher risk for blood clots. So even though we don't think of pregnancy as being a high risk state, it kind of is in certain respects. And therefore, sometimes birth control may be worth it. So which method you wanna use depends primarily on your goal. Do you wanna just prevent pregnancy? Do you wanna regulate your bleeding pattern? In which case a progestin only, which thins the lining might be good for you. Do you wanna prevent sexually transmitted infections? Because only a barrier method can do that. Um, do you wanna prevent premenstrual symptoms? Um, in which case you want probably a combined hormonal contraception, which just shuts down the whole access, like we said, so that you don't get that spike in the middle of your cycle, which causes bloating, breast tenderness, moodiness, or headaches. Um, if you want nicer skin, if you have trouble with acne, or if you have coarse hair, otherwise known as hirsutism, you might also want a method with estrogen in, in it. Other things to consider, Breast, if, are you breastfeeding, in which case you might want to be only on progestin or non-hormonal, or do you have any of the contraindications that we spoke about? Um, so thank you. All my, um, all my uh, information comes from ACOG, which is our national um, OBGYN society. 
Um, and I also just wanted to wrap up the whole session before we do our question and answer period by saying thank you to all the speakers who were on today, Dr. Denise Moses and Eliana Fine, to Joma and its board of directors, um, to the Women's Health Initiative Board, the moderators, um, and to all of our sponsors, including JScreen, um, Turo, um, Sherman Abrams Labs, Jewish Fertility Foundation Extend Fertility. They are all partners in women's health and promoting women's health. Um, and um, to everyone who helped publicize and spread awareness about this event, I hope you guys all learned something today. You can follow Joma and all of the speakers who spoke today on social media for more information. And um, we're gonna do uh, the question and answer period now. If there's anything that you wanna hear about in the next couple of days, let us know. I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you, Javi. Thank you so much. So for our first question, um, for our question and answer session, we'd like to start by asking at what age should you first see a gynecologist? Uh, um, so I'm just gonna jump in and answer that. So uh, the first age that you should see a gynecologist, I mean, ACOG recommends about 13 to 15 years old. I would say that is mostly just to get an overview or a lay of the land. Um, and um, if somebody is sexually active before then, um, or um, has some reason to see a gynecologist, for example, their periods are very heavy, or they have um, pain, then they should absolutely um, see a gynecologist whenever it is indicated for them. Otherwise, pap smears start at age 21, unless, again, you're sexually active prior, um, and um, that would be a good time as well. Thank you. Um... Okay, and then this question was submitted um, by someone in the audience anonymously. Um, why are self-breast exams not recommended? Um, I'll answer that because I discussed uh, that issue. Um, essentially, they're not recommended because um, a lot of women don't really know what they're feeling for. There are different um, uh, changes that can be associated with a certain women. Some women have more fibrocystic type of breasts, things like that. And for most women that are at average risk, it's not shown to be helpful. Thank you. Um, another question which was submitted anonymously, is it normal for women to have daily vaginal discharge? What is normal discharge versus not normal discharge? Um, I can answer that too. Um, it is totally normal for women to have uh, vaginal discharge um, and Abnormal discharge uh, would be something that has a fishy type of odor, different color, um, or causes itching or burning. Um, with those type of um, questions or issues, you can definitely talk to your OBGYN. Thank you. Another anonymous question. Um, how is endometriosis, endometriosis diagnosed? Is it only through laparoscopic surgery or are there other ways to diagnose it? We're going to address endometriosis on Tuesday night, but the answer is to definitively know that it's endometriosis. It needs to be um, laparoscopy. That's the gold standard. Um, but typically, we start treating it before we take somebody to laparoscopy based on symptoms. Thank you. Another anonymous question from the audience. I get acne every time I ovulate and get my period. What can I do? So, um, what you can do is be on combined hormonal birth control, which would stop that spike in hormone levels around your ovulation. Um, and then if that does not work for you, then you can also see a dermatologist for extra, um, extra medications. Can you please talk about the increased risk of breast cancer from hormonal birth control, if any? Yes, so there can be an increased risk of um, breast cancer with hormonal birth control. Um, it is not appreciable enough in the general population to tell someone not to be on birth control. If they do have a increased risk for breast cancer, for example, their BRCA, or if they've had um, some pathology on a biopsy before that would place them at increased risk, then they should discuss it with their doctor. What can a single woman do to find out if she is healthy in terms of her fertility? We're going to answer that tomorrow night. Tune in tomorrow night. Okay. Um, are there anatomical issues that can create urinary urgency? 
Um, I don't know if you like Denise or Eliana answer, but I can also answer if they don't. Um, yes, there are anatomical issues. Um, sometimes being uh, overweight can cause an issue, or sometimes having um, an issue with your urinary sphincter. Um, definitely see your OBGYN for an exam so that they can uh, determine what the problem is. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about the copper IUD, the care guard? Uh, is there a specific question to answer about it? There are um, like side, like any side effects or complications. Okay, so we're going to touch on the um, copper ID a little bit more on Tuesday night, but um, yeah, so the copper ID, because it's non-hormonal, um, you're going to get your period every month. It's not going to lighten your bleeding or anything like that. Um, what women do complain about with the copper IUD is that sometimes the bleeding is heavier and crampier than it normally is. So if you're somebody who already has crampy or heavy bleeding to begin with, I don't recommend the copper IUD. If you're somebody who has normal periods um, and doesn't want to be on hormonal birth control, the copper ID is a really great option. Thank you. Another anonymous question for Dr. Wertheimer. Is it true that birth control is contraindicated for those with migraine with aura? I think you did mention it in your presentation. Yes. Yeah. So if somebody has migraines with aura, the aura tells us that there's a vascular component to their migraines. And because of the um, increased risk of blood clots with estrogen, we're super careful in that population. And we do not use combined um, unless there is a bigger risk. Like in medicine, everything is a risk benefits ratio. Can someone have break breakthrough bleeding from a pap test? I would not call that breakthrough bleeding. I would call that um, spotting because breakthrough bleeding, we typically mean um, it's you're breaking through your birth control or some hormonal access. Um, a pap smear uh, touches the tip of the cervix like Eliana showed in her, um, in her slides. And so um, the cells on the ectoservice could be what we call friable or bleed easily. Um, and, um, and so yeah, you can have some spotting with your pap smear, but it would not be uterine blood, it would be cervical or um, uh, like the ectoservix blood, which is um, important for NIDA purposes which we're not going to talk about, but you can talk, you can let your um, local Orthodox rabbi know that this bleeding was from my pap smear. Okay, a couple of questions for SD. Um, in terms of J-screen, how recent is it okay to um, go since your last test? So it's always a good idea to check in to see if there's anything new when you're planning for a pregnancy. Um, I would say you're probably safe if you got tested within the last two, three years, um, but that can really change at any time. Um, I'm hearing of new panels with over 500 diseases that are kind of on the horizon. So um, it's always a good idea to check in with whoever tested you in the first place to see what you were, like how up to date you are. Thank you. And um, is Jason, J screen covered by insurance at all? Um, it is and it's not. Um, we have a model where we just charge a program fee of $149. So people pay that upfront. Then they also submit their insurance information and we just collect whatever we can out of their insurance. So if it ends up costing more than $149, our donors will subsidize the cost for you. If it's less than $149, you don't get your money back. Um, and it's just, you know, part of the program processing and handling fees. Yeah. Um, okay. And does combined, this is a question probably for Dr. Wertheimer, do combined oral contraceptives decrease milk production while breastfeeding? Um, that's a great question. There have been a lot of studies um, recently, I think, on that and also on progestin-only methods. Um, I would say it's possible um, that it could, but I don't think that there's any definitive data that it does. I myself did go on combined hormonal contraception um, while breastfeeding because uh, there was no good data to tell me not to. Um, I don't know if, Denise, if Dr. Moses uh, has something to add to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, is it okay to take birth control back to back and skip periods? So skipping that placebo week. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you do it. You go. go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, it is okay. Um, I usually recommend to my patients um, not to go more than three months because otherwise they're um, at increased risk for breaks or bleeding. But it's not dangerous to your health. Correct. 
How long after a pap test would someone typically experience spotting? Probably within the first 24 hours, but again, it's not uterine blood. It would only be cervical blood, so it shouldn't be an issue. Did you combine oral contraceptives cause me mood swings or depression? And combine what? Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes they can have um, emotional side effects, um, but it really does depend on the woman and her other um, uh, symptoms and what other issues she may have. Um, Dr. Wertheimer, I don't know if you want to continue that. Um, I would say that it's possible. Um, and if she's, it's probably, I would say that there's probably some baseline um, component there and that should be uh, explored before going off your birth control. Um, but if you, you know, if you feel that uh, you absolutely had nothing before and then you did when you were on the birth control, um, I would say it's possible and you should discuss it with your OBGYN. Thank you. Do pregnancy hormones affect whether laser hair removal will last post-pregnancy? Um, I love laser, so I'm going to take this question. <laughs> um, so your pregnancy hormone, so the areas which are hormonal, um, which are hormonal hair, so not all areas on your body um, not, not all the hair on your body is hormonally responsive. Those that are um, could come back after pregnancy because you're in, during pregnancy, you have a surge in the hormones, which can cause, um, sorry, during pregnancy, your estrogen levels go up. And so you may see a decrease in hair. Um, and then the decrease of those hormones afterwards, you may see a resurgence of that hair. I'm not sure that the, um, I'm not sure that uh, the pregnancy hormones themselves cause the hair to come back. It's just the fluctuations in hormones. Thank you. Should you wait to get pregnant right after stopping the pill? How long does birth control last for? You don't have to wait to get pregnant. Um, it usually lasts for a little bit. Um, sometimes if people have been on it for a long time, it can take a little bit of time for your body to get back to normal, um, but there's no need to um, have a waiting period at all. Thank you. We will be taking um, questions for about another two minutes. Um, we, will, we are getting a lot of questions about sex drive, so we will be doing um, a more in-depth um, look in a, in a future lecture. Um, but do oral contraceptives affect um, sex drive? Yeah, so oral contraceptions can affect your sex drive. Um, I would say that more commonly what affects sex drive is things like being tired um, or uh, lifestyle factors. Maybe pain could be associated with it. Um, your, your brain is your biggest sex organ. Um, and so that's where I would start to analyze first. But yes, combined birth control, because it decreases the spike in hormones with ovulation, it can also decrease your libido. Um, and I just wanted to touch on what you were going to say about, there was a lot of questions on um, sex drive. We are planning on doing a sexual health lecture, which will be a very in-depth um, lecture um, covering everything from anatomy to psychology um, to pelvic PT. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be one of our specialized ones, probably in January or February so much. At this point, we are at the end of our question and answer section. Um, if you'd like to continue with closing remarks. Um, I think this was awesome. I loved all the questions. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, and we'll see you guys tomorrow night, hopefully. Okay.